Good evening. Welcome to our evening service here at Victory Baptist Church. Glad you're with us this evening. Tonight we're going to introduce another Baptist distinctive, and it's a, it is the one that is called a saved or regenerate church membership. Very interesting. We're going to sing about salvation tonight. So number 414, number 414. In your songbook, let's turn there and stand together. Save, save. I found a friend who is all to me. 414. we thank you for salvation we thank you that we can gather together in unity around this truth that we know that jesus christ is the way the truth and the life that we've found a friend who is all to each of us that we know that that what we have in christ is true we thank you for that lord we thank you for saving us i pray father you help us to see these things in your word of how the church should function and how we should believe as as bible believers and we ask father that you would help um, those who cannot be here tonight help them to be able to get better if they're not feeling well. We ask, Lord, that you would um, just grow, help your church to grow and be edified. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'll repeat a few announcements from this morning. Uh, first of all, thanks again to those who helped at the farmer's market yesterday. It was, I think, a uh, success. We don't always uh, see the fruit immediately. We don't know what God's going to do with the seeds that are planted, but... We discussed this even as a family last night that we should not uh, be weary in well-doing because we know that if we faint, we'll reap in the end if we faint not. And so uh, we uh, trust God to work through all the gospel truth that went out yesterday and thankful for all the work that was done to make that happen. We'll try to do it again in two weeks on Saturday, Sunday, uh, Saturday August 6th, and then the next day on the August 7th, looking forward to having brother Tim Carpenter with us uh, from Bearing Precious Seed Ministries. And then two weeks from then, we'll plan to celebrate the Lord's Supper with the birthday fellowship lunch and the afternoon service as we're accustomed to. And then one more farmer's market than on the 27th. We did have one scheduled for the 13th. It looks like we won't be able to do that one. But uh, I'd love to see that grow because I think it's a good way to reach out to the community. But uh, we're doing what we can. So August 27th, we'll see about doing that as well see the calendar on the bulletin board to sign up for cleaning and lawn mowing and hope you'll join us on wednesday as well for our prayer service all right 
Let's turn in our songbook again, 326. 326. Saved by the blood of the crucified, one the only way to be saved. 326. tonight. I hope you can truly say that. My sins are all pardoned. My guilt is all gone. What a great thing to be able to know to be true. Not just to say it or to sing it, but to know that it is true. Let's turn in our Bibles now to Acts chapter 2. The book of Acts chapter 2. We've been talking for the last several weeks on Sunday evenings or afternoons about the Baptist distinctives. The Baptist distinctives of these are eight biblical marks that together uniquely identify what Baptists have historically recognized to uh, be necessary to truly merit the title of a New Testament church. The Baptist distinctives form a nice, easy-to-remember acrostic, uh, Baptists. So the eight letters, Baptists, plural. And uh, 
So we've thus far, we've been through, what would it be now, five of those? We're on the sixth now. So the B, well, who, who can remember? What is the B in, in Baptists? Who can remember this? Anyone? Yes. Biblical authority is correct. You got it. And the A, what is the A? Yes, sir. Yes, the autonomy of the local church. What about the P? What about the P? Yes, sir. Priesthood of the believer and the first T. Do you remember what we looked at for the first T? There's two T's. Two offices, right? There'll be another T, two ordinances uh, coming up uh, next time. I guess it'll next time around. We're getting there anyways. <laughs> so, uh, and then the I. We looked at I the last uh, few weeks, couple weeks. What is the I? Individual soul liberty is correct. Yes, okay. So some wonderful truths, biblical authority, the truth that the Bible is the authority for all matters of, of uh, faith and practice, everything we, we submit to God's Revelation, no, uh, God, there are places where God designates authority to humans, but it all comes back to what is God, what is God, uh, what is God set forth in his word? That is the, what our, our authority, uh, that we don't rely on tradition, we don't rely on uh, pragmatism to see what might work or what might not work. We rely on the word of God for our authority. The autonomy of the local church, we don't answer to any higher authority but Jesus Christ. We don't answer to... Uh, uh, diocese or district offices or things like that and then the P was the priesthood of the believer you recognize that every believer through the blood of Jesus Christ everybody who is truly saved has direct access to the Father through the mediator the one mediator between God and men the man Christ Jesus we don't need another another spiritual leader of some sort to be to go between you and God you cannot have a spiritual leader to uh, to come before you and to say you must confess your sins to that leader or that I can absolve you or a spiritual leader can somehow pronounce absolution, absolution I should say, of sins. That is between you and God. And then the T, the two offices, we talked about how those are pa uh, the pastor and the deacon. And then the I being the individual soul liberty, we've been talking about how uh, we believe that uh, no man should re should. Uh, require or coerce or force somebody to believe something against their will. Yes, we, uh, we want everybody to believe the right thing. We, we, would, we want to proclaim the truth from the word of God, but everybody should have the right, we believe. Nobody should force somebody to worship God or worship anything against their own conscience. We'd rather have somebody to, to, uh, to be worshiping according to their own conscience wrongly and then be able to come to the truth and somebody to be forced to believe something true, but they don't really actually believe it. And they never come to the knowledge of the truth. So individual soul, liberty. And now we come to, tonight we, be, we begin to consider the crucial and uniquely Baptist doctrine of what's called a saved. The S is saved. A saved church membership. It's often referred to as a regenerate church membership, but saved works better in the, in the uh, acrostic. So this doctrine acknowledges that, biblically speaking, regeneration, that is being born again by the Spirit of God through Jesus Christ, regeneration is a prerequisite to being a member of one of the Lord's churches. Now, a key passage that teaches this doctrine is found here in Acts chapter 2. If you're not turned there already, I'd appreciate you would be benefit from this more if you would turn to Acts chapter 2, and we will begin reading. At verse 36, before we read, just a little bit of background. Some of you probably know this already, but the setting here is uh, what is re commonly referred to as Pentecost. It, it, this is shortly after the Lord Jesus Christ, 10 days after the Lord Jesus Christ ascended uh, from the dead, 50 days ascended to earth from heaven. He rose from the dead 50 days prior to Pentecost. And so we find here that Peter is preaching to devout Jews from every nation under heaven. They were gathered together for the Feast of Pentecost at Jerusalem, and what a perfect time to preach the gospel with all those people there. And so Peter is preaching here, and the church is mentioned as the church is in its infancy here, and we're going to see a pattern for how the church ought to operate. So Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Peter is in the middle of his sermon here. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts, in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, 
Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for showing us how we ought to operate, even in our individual lives as believers, but also uh, in this wonderful uh, organization. Even some have called it an organism, but organization, institution of the church, uh, your plan A, B, and everything else for this age as we gather together to worship, uh, to go out to preach the gospel, to disciple, to make disciples, and to teach all nations, to teach to observe all things whatsoever you have commanded us to do. So, Lord, we ask that you'd help us to function the way you commanded, not to go after our own designs, but to follow your instructions for us. We praise you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So here in this passage that we just read, we find a description of the very first church as it was forming in Jerusalem. Now, since then, there have been thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, of New Testament churches established all over the world. But this is recorded for us as a pattern of how a church functions. Now, I don't mind acknowledging here at this point, because we're going to talk tonight about requirements uh, regarding the church and regarding membership and that sort of thing. I don't mind acknowledging that the idea of a, of a requirement of any kind is uh, today in this day and age, to many people, that in itself is audacious. Thus, the idea that a person must first demonstrate that they have repented and understood and believed the gospel of Jesus Christ in order to join a church, that idea is foreign to many people within Christendom. Not only that, but the idea that any, of any, that any form of, any kind of formal membership at all in a local congregation, it's mocked by some people. And that's not all. I fully recognize that the idea of a church being an actual uh, tangible thing, the idea of a church being an actual local organized assembly as opposed to just some nebulous blob of people out there somewhere, that idea also is difficult for many people to accept today. Basically what I'm saying, if, I, if you boil that all down, what I'm saying is that the, the Bible teaches all three of these things, regenerate, church, and membership. The Bible teaches all three of these things, but each of these things requires a certain measure of accountability, commitment, and service, and these things have fallen on very hard times in 21st century, particularly America, in 21st century American Christianity. But these things, these, by these things I mean accountability, commitment, and service, they have always been eagerly embraced by biblical Christianity right from the beginning because they are clearly taught in the scriptures. Now, in order to truly embrace the idea of a saved church membership, we have to have at least a basic understanding of the idea of each of these concepts. So we have rege three concepts, regenerate, uh, church, and membership. I'm not going to go quite in that order. I'm going to change the first two around and start with uh, church first. And uh, this will be review for some of you, I'm sure. I've talked about this before, even not in the not-so-distant past. But I want us to be sure, clear that we have an understanding of what the Bible uh, what the Bible says that church is, because the, uh, uh, many uh, people do not have the, you may, you may have noticed this, many people do not have the right idea of church. Now the word church, and we find it here in Acts 2.47, and the Lord added to the church daily 
such as should be saved. So in this verse, we have all three concepts, don't we? We have, some, we have people being added. That would be what we would call membership. Then we have the church. Then we have such as should be saved. That's regenerate. And we see this word church here in verse 47. And uh, it's this word, the same word we find all over the New Testament. We find the word church. And the word church in the New Testament, in the Bible, comes from the Greek word ekklesia. And the word ekklesia literally means an assembly of people called out from their homes into some public place together for a specific purpose. I'll say that again. The, the word literally means an assembly of people called out from their homes into some public place together for a specific purpose. This was a term that was used in the Greek language uh, to denote uh, political meetings, but God chose this word also to refer to the assembly of believers organized for worship and service to the Lord Jesus Christ. So now the very etymology, the very meaning, root meaning of the word for church refutes much of the uh, common misconceptions that people have about church. Now if you were to do one of these, uh, yeah, I'm sure you've seen some of these embarrassing you know, ask out on the street interviews where people go around. One of them I really hate is when people go around and ask questions. I, I have a geography degree right here from UW Oshkosh, and when people ask geography questions to people on the streets, it's like, I don't even want to hear this because people don't know where things are. You know what I'm talking about. People ask these questions, who is, who is the president or vice president? They get it wrong and things like that, right? Well, I think you'd find something similar if people were to go out on the street and ask, uh, what is a church? Or if, you know, like uh, do a documentary, like instead of what is a woman, it would be, what is a church? And I think you would find the same type of thing that you would rarely get an answer uh, that is anything close to what it act the word actually means. Now, some would say that the church, uh, the church, the idea of church is refers to all the Christians all over the world, wherever they are, that's just the church. But does that fit the meaning of the word? Do those people come out of their homes and all assemble together in one place, all the Christians of the world? No. Now, one day, you know, in heaven, yes. But today, no. And we find in the Bible, we've looked at this before, so I won't go into great detail. We find in the Bible that the, the Lord Jesus Christ, he writes letters, and he wrote seven different letters in Revelation 2 and 3, seven different letters to seven different churches. He didn't just say, I'm writing to, uh, writing to uh, the one church that is all over the place, that they were churches, and we see that usage all over, and that fits the root meaning of the word. Now, others would say that any place where any group of people are together who call themselves Christians and happen to be together at the same time, they would consider that to be a church. Uh, out at the farmer's market yesterday, a young man, we were talking for a while, and at some point in our conversation, uh, you know, we were talking, I was talking about church, and at some point in our congregation, he said, well, my apartment, my apartment building is a church. And I said, oh yeah, really, how, how is that? And he said, well, because... Uh, the Bible says somewhere that where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. And there's people there in that building, and there's some people who are of the faith, he said, and so that's a church. I had to explain to him, no, that's in you know, Matthew 18, and the context there is talking about uh, God's assurance that when God's people gather together and to make a decision uh, by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, that Christ is there helping us and guiding us with that decision and and so anyways, people have the wrong idea about what a church is. I'm sure you heard many of this. My church is the lake, or my church is the golf course, or my church is pretty much fill in the blank wherever I would rather be, is basically what it comes to. Uh, others just think of church as a building or a meeting place. Now about that, now I think this is pretty simple, but it seems to have been lost on us today. There is the, the great debate that you might have heard of. Is the church people or is it a place the correct answer it's actually both what is that definition of church or of the ecclesia assembly of people called out from their homes into some public place together for a purpose so now technically the word refers to the the people that are called out okay so but if they don't if there's just people and they go to the store and go all over the place then it's not the church is it they're gathered together in one place and so in order for the people to be a church or an ecclesia, they must have a place to meet. It doesn't have to be a building. We could meet at the park. It would be church, right? But it's a place. So there's no confusion about this 
You know, for anything else in the world, you might say, oh, I'm going to the bank. Going to the bank. Well, but is the bank, is it the people that work at the bank? Or is it the building? Well, nobody cares because you know you're going to the building and there's people there. If you went to an empty building, it wouldn't be the bank. And if you went to the people and there was no place for the bank, it wouldn't be that either. I'm going to the hospital. Oh, well, is the hospital, is it the people of the hospital or is it the place? Well, you need both in order for it to be a hospital. And so it's interesting that people have this dilemma only when it comes to the church. So in this passage, we find that the church is made up of people who have certain characteristics. The church isn't what people want to call it, what they want to refer to it as or think of it as. The church is what God says that it is. And so we find some characteristics in this passage, particularly five of them, and we're going to look at these. First we see, uh, and we're going to then dive into this a little further, we see that they are saved. People are saved, we find in verse 47, Again, at the end of uh, verse 47, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So who is being added to the church? People who are saved, right? If you look at verse, verses 36 through 41, we find that Peter is preaching, and he's preaching a message that they must believe in order to be added uh, to the church. And uh, we'll come back to that in a bit. Uh, we also see in verse 42, that they were baptized. I'm sorry, sorry, verse 41. They that gladly received his word. So receiving his word, Peter was preaching the gospel. They received, they believed the gospel message. They repented, he, Peter talked about that. They believed the gospel message. And those who believed the gospel message were what? They were baptized. Okay, so you have it in that order. They were saved, they received his word. Those were the people that were baptized. It wasn't anybody else. It was only those who had believed the word. So they were baptized. And those were the people we see that were added unto them, it says. There were 3,000 of them. 3,000 of them, specific number is given. 3,000 souls were saved, baptized, and added to the church. And that is the New Testament pattern. The New Testament model that we see is that they'd be saved and baptized and then added to the church. Go uh, ye into all the world and it, go ye and teach all nations, baptizing them. It's, it teach, refers to making disciples after they become disciples of Jesus Christ. You baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and then you teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That's the New Testament pattern. And speaking of teaching them what uh, the Lord commanded, that's the next thing we see in verse 42. We find three other characteristics of the local church. Simple expectations of people who are a part of the local church. We find the characteristics here are they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Okay, so they held to biblical doctrine. It wasn't a, a, meant to be a social club where, well, this is a fun place. These are nice people. They're kind to me. They, they love me. I don't necessarily believe that stuff, but I just like to, like to be around them. That's, that's, not, that, that's not the way it should be for a church member. I will add there, anybody can come and attend our churches. They don't, if they don't believe the doctrine, but they want to come and listen and maybe come to agree with the word of God, that would be great. Biblical doctrine. Fourthly, we see fellowship. We see fellowship and in breaking of bread. So there was, uh, here we see an example also. Again, they had to, they were, they were in agreement on, on the doctrine of the word of God. So there had to be uh, people who knew each other, they knew they agreed, but there's also fellowship. They were actually able to break bread with people. They weren't just people all over the world. They were in a, a local congregation where they could do like uh, we do once a month as we gather together. We, we have fellowship. Of course, we have fellowship even right now. Fellowship isn't just when we eat, but there is also breaking of bread. So there is fellowship one with another. It's not, the church isn't meant to be simply walking, you know, in the door uh, sitting down and then just going home. There's meant to be fellowship. There's meant to be uh, exhorting one another, as it says in Hebrews 10. There's meant to be relationships and building each other up and that sort of thing. Praying for one another is, and that's the next thing we see in prayers. They prayed with each other. They knew each other. They saw each other on a regular basis and prayed uh, for each other, as we do on Wednesday evenings. That is 
why it wouldn't have to be Wednesday, it could be Tuesday, it could be Thursday, but that's why we have a midweek service, so we can dedicate a specific time that we can come together to focus on prayer, because the Bible commends that to us. And so again, in verse 47, we see the key verse, which I already mentioned, uh, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. So we see, again, from this passage, that we can conclude that the church is made up of people who at the very least are committed to these five very simple, basic criteria. And so we find that is, at a basic level, what is a church? There's much more we could say, but that's all, and we're going to look at that for now. Secondly, it's a regenerate church membership. So we're going to talk about the word regenerate. Uh, so we believe that verse 47 and uh, in other verses in Scripture teach that in order for a person to become a member of a local congregation, they must first be regenerate. Now that word is in different forms in the Bible. It's used in that form uh, in Titus chapter 3 where it uh, says, uh, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of of water regeneration of the word, I believe is how it goes, regeneration. And so it must be regenerate. So what do we mean when we say regenerate or saved? I think most of us know the answer to this, but it does get a little more challenging when you consider that uh, the Lord knows those who are his, it says. I think it's Second Timothy. The Lord knows those who are his. God is the only one who truly knows everybody who is saved, right? God knows everybody's heart. And so that becomes a little more challenging when a church must consider whether or not to admit a person into membership, whether or not their testimony uh, is credible, whether it seems they truly understand the gospel and truly, truly turn from their sins. How do we determine that? Uh, do we just accept anybody into membership who calls themselves a Christian? Well, first of all, it starts with what does it mean to be regenerate? So let's turn to John chapter 3 basic stuff here, but I want to at least go over it. As time goes on, the tendency for Christianity is just to get lax on these things. The tendency is to be, well, they say they're a Christian. Well, they said, that I, love, I love Jesus. They said, but the Bible gives specific, tells us specifically what it means. To be regenerate, one of the things that, that the way regenerate is phrased in the Bible is to be born again, to be born again. So let's read here John chapter 3. I know many of you are familiar with this, but let's review it. John 3, verses 1 through 7. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I'll just stop right there. That's a, that's a serious statement, isn't it? He's saying, unless this, this thing happens to you, you are born again, born of the Spirit. Unless this happens, you will not see the kingdom of God. You will not be a part of the kingdom that we talked about this morning, unless you are what's called here, born again. And it's, it's amazing how many people you talk to, or if you, if you ask them, are you a Christian? And they, uh, they, they might say, yeah, sure, I'm a Christian. And you say, have you been born again? And they look at you kind of strangely. What are you talking about, born again? But Jesus said that it's a requirement. You cannot see his kingdom unless you have this thing called being born again. So Nicodemus goes on, he says, Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Okay, so there's been some debate and confusion about that. He says, born, it says born again. When, you're, when something happens again, it's happening a second time, right? It's happening at least a second time. Here he's talking about two things. Born of, everyone must be born of water and of the Spirit. Now, Jesus isn't concerned here about somebody being born the first time, why is that? Because everybody's been born the first time, right? But there are, those who, there are those who look at born of water, and they say that's referring to baptism. 
that you have to be born of water in the sense of, of being sprinkled or poured uh, with water, and that's part of being born again. But verse 6 clears that right up. Well, it's, another, it's a very good example of all you just got to keep reading. It says that which is born of flesh is flesh. It doesn't say that which is born of baptism. It says that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. So you have water compared to flesh, and spirit to spirit. So they're born of water. It's referring to amniotic fluid. When you're born, there's water, and you must be born of the spirit. And that's what Jesus is concerned about here. Everybody's been born of water, but have you been born of the spirit? Have you been born again? He says, marvel not. Don't be surprised that I said unto thee, you must be born again. So this is a, a spiritual life. We, are, we find in Ephesians chapter 2 that, that, that every person is spiritually dead apart from Christ. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. And apart from the Holy Spirit, uh, through the, uh, and the Bible teaches that we are, the, the Holy Spirit uh, regenerates us as we have trusted Jesus Christ. Now these things happen simultaneously, but it says when, when we trust Christ, then we are born again. We find here as uh, Jesus clears this up, as he, as he goes on, he talks about what the serpent. He knew that Nicodemus would be familiar with the serpent in the wilderness. And, uh, and if you're familiar with that, there was a serpent or snake that, that uh, the snakes were biting the people. They were complaining. So God, uh, that's how much God likes complaining. God sends uh, snakes. And uh, they were biting the people. And they put, uh, God had Moses put on a, on a pole, a serpent, and whoever would look at it. It wasn't they had to, you have to do this, that, or all these other things. It was they had to look. And that was an example of how Christ must be lifted up. It says in verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him, that's a picture there, look to Jesus. That's what it means to be born again. To, if you look to Jesus, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then we know this verse, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, as, we, uh, study, as we study this out, we find that this belief uh, in Jesus Christ is it, it refer, referred to as receiving him. It involves uh, turning to Jesus, which involves repentance, turning from sin, which Peter mentions. We'll come back to that. But let's turn now to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. In verse 23. It says, being born again. There we see that again. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. And it clarifies that. What is that? By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And look what it says. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Okay, so we have the word of God. We have the Bible. And we find the gospel in the word of God. And the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ, how he died for your sins. And so when that, the gospel is preached, it comes out of the Bible. It doesn't come out of our own reasoning. And as we preach that gospel message from the incorruptible seed from the word of God. It says you are born again. It says being born again. That's how people are born again, regenerated, given spiritual life. Going, uh, Jesus talked about that the person who, who uh, believes on him will pass, will not come into condemnation, but has passed from death unto life. Spiritual life, that is regeneration. And let's go back now to Acts chapter 2. And look at this early church scenario. And we find here that Peter preached a message. Just as Peter described the gospel being preached to you in 1 Peter, we just read that. Here is Peter's example of how he did that. And we find it, you know, again in verse 36, we saw it before. He preached them 
that they, must, they should recognize something about Jesus Christ who is crucified. And the person, the one who is crucified, we've sung tonight, saved by the blood of the crucified one. That, that person, according, there's two things about him that it says in this verse that are important. What are they? But the one who you crucified is what? what who is he? Who is he? In verse 36. I want to see if you're awake. Yes. Uh, Lord. Lord. What's the other one? What? Yes, Lord and Christ. Okay, so Peter is telling these unsaved people, you need to recognize that this Jesus, who is risen from the dead, he was crucified, risen from the dead, he is Lord, both Lord and Christ. It says they were pricked in their heart. It wasn't just that they would, oh, that sounds good to me. They were pricked in their heart. Okay, and then he goes, we, we go on to see that this involved what he says in verse 33. He said, Peter said unto them, repent. They ask him, what should we do? The first word he says is repent. I've talked about this before, so I won't go deep into it because this is, this is a verse in scripture that uh, you know, needs to be examined, needs to be considered in light of other scriptures because on face value, let's be honest, it says repent and be baptized. Does that mean death, baptismal regeneration? Does that mean you have to be baptized to be saved? Well, there are many other scriptures that make it clear that you don't. But what do you do with this one? Well, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Uh, that word for, it can mean uh, that you need to be baptized in order to have the forgiveness of sins, or it can mean uh, you need to be baptized because you have received the remission of sins. That word can mean either and from the context, you could, you could see that. We use it that way, actually, in our English language. If, uh, I don't know, do they do this? I probably don't do this anymore. But in the old days, anyways, the old west or whatever, you go into the post office or whatever, and they have on the store, wanted for murder. Now, was that sign saying, hey, I'm really looking for somebody to murder somebody? Really looking, uh, well, what we want here for murder is we want somebody in order that there can be a murder. Or are they saying, so, so-and-so is wanted because of a murder? It's the same way the word for is being used here. It goes along with many other passages where we find that there, are, there is no work involved in salvation, that it's only by, by faith in Christ alone that a person is saved, that it's not of any uh, work or ritual. Paul, Paul said that, uh, that he was sent not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So if the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, how can he then exclude baptism from the gospel in that verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 1? because baptism isn't, isn't directly a part of the gospel. Why does Peter include it here? It's important. We might talk about it more next week. It is important. Why does Peter include it then here? And there's other verses that do, do this as well. Very closely linked with repentance. Very closely linked with salvation. Well, I believe it's because those who would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ were expected to follow that with obedience in believer's baptism, which is by, which is by immersion. It wasn't uh, in, in, the, in the days of John the Baptist, in the days of the early church, it wasn't that, yeah, I'm one of those, I'm a Christian, but I haven't been baptized. Well, I'm a Christian, and I have been baptized. It was, if you're a Christian, baptism doesn't save you, but if you're a Christian, you're going to get baptized. You're going to get baptized and get added to the church, because that's what God was doing. It wasn't, I'm a Christian, now I'm going to see about how, well, how I'm going to do things. It was, now I'm a Christian, I'm going to see how God wants me to do things. And that was an evidence, uh, that was evidence that they meant business. Now, in America, we don't experience this as much. Um, baptism is a public event, and there are people who get ostracized and, and uh, disowned or at least given the cold shoulder by their families for being baptized. But there are people in other places in the world, to, even today, where if you, get up, if you get up and publicly testify to your faith and you're baptized, you, 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 you might have a price on your head for that. You might be in big trouble uh, with your family. You might be in big trouble with whoever because you have, you have publicly identified with Jesus Christ in believer's baptism. And so as an example of that, and, and, uh, and so that was the second one we looked at. Part of, baptism is not part of regeneration. But it follows, and thus what we see the pattern here is that, and we'll look at membership in itself next week, but in order to become a part of the church, the people were, were saved, but they were also baptized. They that glad, verse 41, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Okay, so they were baptized, and then we find 
that the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And we find the pattern in verse 47 as well. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So we see that pattern, saved, baptized, added to the church. That's the pattern we find in the word of God. Now, when it comes to, and I'll just touch on this now, we're, we're getting close to being out of time here, but uh, when it comes to a person joining the church, we'll talk about membership more, more next week, uh, but I just want to touch on this. If you could, let's turn to Matthew chapter 3. While you're turning there, I'll make some comments. Matthew chapter 3. Uh, if, God, as I mentioned before, the Lord knoweth them that are his. He's the only one who, who knows for sure. And if somebody, if somebody you first meet comes to, comes to you, comes to me as a pastor, maybe you might sit down with, with Brother Spanbar and they give their testimony, we are not omniscient, we can't see their heart. And so, but, but, and so we certainly want to believe what they're saying and want to accept their testimony. And when we do that, uh, there, you know, there's some consideration for should, a, should we recommend this person for baptism? And then what we do, because we are a, a church of uh, believers, not a, church, not a congregational church, we're not in the, the, you know, a, a Presbyterian, we're not a church of, uh, that's ruled simply by the leadership, we have a vote. And so when a person is a, a candidate, they, would come to, they might come to me, we might sit down with, uh, with uh, Jack or other men of the church and, and hear their testimony. We'd say, uh, they might say, I, I want to be baptized or I want to be a member of this church. And we might ask why and why would they want to be baptized? And then they, we ask them to give their testimony of salvation, how, how they know that they've been born again and what evidence do we see that they truly mean business with the Lord. And so one of the things that becomes difficult at that point is when we, as a church, want to have a regenerate church membership, we want to be careful, we want to guard against allowing people into membership that don't know the Lord. That's a, that's a great problem throughout church history, a great problem in churches today is churches are, are filled with professing believers that aren't necessarily so. And so we aren't the judge of people. We do have to make a discernment whether they're giving a credible testimony of salvation. And one, we, we have kind of an interesting balance in the Bible. In Acts chapter 2, we see they re gladly re they received his word gladly. That same day, they were baptized. Real quick, right? It sounds like pretty quickly they were baptized. Um, but we also see here in Matthew chapter 3 where John the Baptist, um, he was baptizing, obviously, and he, he gives us an example of how there was some caution about who they would baptize and who they would. So I'm going to read and probably just have to, have to drop it here at some point and just pick it up next week. But uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 1, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, same thing Peter said, right? Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea in the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. See, they were, they, were, they were confessing. There was repentance there. John had already preached repenting, repentance. Verse 7, we see, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, so they had come uh, there, and I believe if, uh, in Luke it, it's clear that there were people that were coming who wanted to be baptized. He came to his baptism. He just, just said, oh, great, glad to see some of you guys out here. Let's go on, let's get in the water. You want to get baptized? Come on, let's get, get in the water and get baptized. Anybody who wants to get baptized, come on in. That's not what he said, is, he? is it? He said unto them, O generation of vipers. We talked about vipers this morning. O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Then what does he say? Hey, before you're getting in the water, bring forth some fruit worthy of repentance, meat for repentance. Think not to say to your, within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. What was he saying? You guys believe in a false gospel. You believe, just as we talked about in Romans, you believe that just because you come from Abraham, you're right with God. You, I can't baptize you if that's what you believe. He says, we have, think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. 
For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And so we see there, uh, John was careful. He wasn't just going to baptize somebody who came to him uh, with, who had a false understanding of the gospel or somebody who came that was not showing any kind of attitude or fruit of repentance. And so he is careful about that. So I think that's something, you know, we consider that's, we wrestle with that, I think, sometimes is, uh, you know, we have Acts, you know, Acts chapter 2 is basically, okay, they received his word, let's go. And we see here some caution also in this day and age, I think, requires to err on the side of caution as well with the many uh, false gospels circulating today uh, and more confusion, perhaps, that were in those days. So there's other things I could say there. But next week, Lord willing, we'll come back. We talked about church. We talked about uh, re, re, uh, being regenerate. Next week, we'll talk about membership. Does the Bible even teach such a thing as church membership? Is that just something made up? Or does the Bible give us examples and reasons why there should be a such thing as church membership? You know, if it doesn't, then maybe we should chuck it, right? Maybe we shouldn't do it. Okay, if it's just a tradition, maybe we shouldn't have church membership. But I think you know already we're going to find it in the Bible. It's there. And we already saw it in Acts 2.47 uh, this evening. So let's stand together for prayer with that in mind. Dear Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you and praise you for the idea of the church, ecclesia, called out ones to come worship together, assemble together for a purpose purpose to worship and to serve you thank you for that lord it's a perfect idea we do tend to mess it up sometimes but father we pray you'd help us to do everything we do here at victory baptist church according to your word help us to be clear help us not get lax in following the instructions you've given us lord i pray that we would have a membership role at victory baptist church that includes save people lord and i pray that a membership role would grow, but only that it would grow according to uh, your design and not ours. Father, I pray that as we preach the gospel, you would build your church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. But Lord, we ask only that we would do it according to your will. So we pray, Father, you'd help us. I pray if there's anybody here amongst us or within the sound of my voice online who is not regenerate, who is not born again, has not uh, received Christ truly through repentance and faith, I ask, dear Lord, that you would draw them to yourself. And Father, I ask that you would help us to be faithful, to take the word of God and simply give people the good news of Jesus Christ. Pray for those who received the good news yesterday at the farmer's market, that uh, perhaps they have a track laying around that they would pick up and, and read it, and you would prompt their heart to do so, Lord. Help us to be available and ready. Lord, I pray as this world seems to be in de decline or culture, people's lives, that we would be ready to shine the light in dark place with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for saving us, Lord. Thank you that we belong to Jesus. We pray that in his, this is in his precious name. Amen. Starting our songbooks now. With that in mind, number, where did that go? Here it is. Number 391. 391. Do you belong to Jesus? We have, I know, mostly members here tonight. If anybody here online is interested, has been saved, but you haven't been baptized, I encourage you to consider that. If you've been saved, perhaps you've been baptized in a, in a Bible-believing church, and, but not joined, not a member of a church at this time, perhaps you need to consider that as well. We'd love to talk to you about that. 391, I'm still getting there. Let's sing together. Praise the Lord for our salvation. Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever from the no power of evil can sever. He gave his life to ransom my soul.
Since I was lost in sin's degradation, Jesus came down to bring me salvation. Lifted me up from sorrow and shame. Now I belong to Him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Joy floods my soul. Joy floods my soul for Jesus has saved me, freed me from sin that long had enslaved me. His precious blood he gave to redeem me. Now I belong to belongs to me, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Amen. What a beautiful truth. I hope you can sing that with all clarity and assurance that you belong to Jesus. You know that you'll be with him for all of eternity. What a joy that is. It's a joy then that we can be together in God's church and serve and worship him together and love and support and encourage one another. So, all right, let's at this time take up our offerings. Let's have our usher come forward. Thank you, Levi. Why don't you ask God's blessing on the offering, please? Amen. You may be seated. The sun's kind of shining in. It's that time of year. Can we see that all right? Okay, good. Yeah, we're learning this song, He Who Would Valiant Be, written by John Bunyan, the writer of uh, Pilgrim's Progress. Beautiful song. Speaks of the uh, seeking to have the courage to follow the Lord and be bold and, uh, and fight for the faith. And so let's uh, go ahead and sing this song that we're learning. What's that? He who That's about right. That's fine. All right, here we go. He who valiant be against a disaster, let him constancy follow the master. There's no despair. Lord, thou dost defend us with thy 
spirit we know we happy and shall life inherit when fancies be away I fear not what men say great truth that at the end we will have found our home right we'll finally be home we won't be pilgrims and strangers anymore we'll be where where we belong all right let's have the children come for the children's coin offering this evening get the light turned on here get you some buckets here we go one for you one for you one for you a little bit of a shortage of children tonight here you go buddy you want to trade with him? You can have a blue one. There you go. I don't want to give him a pink one. <laughs> All right. Are we ready? Now we're going to talk to... Sophia wants a pink one too. Right. Now we're going to talk to the king. So what are we going to do? We're going to bow our heads, right? Close our eyes and focus on the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for these children. Thank you, Lord, that you've blessed us uh, with them and trusted them to us. And Lord, we ask that you'd help them to say, serve the Lord. Thank you for... Um, the service that some of the children have done even this, this week for you. Lord, we just pray that you bless this offering. Help us to have wisdom uh, to use it to, uh, to the best uh, situation that you would have us to use it for, Lord. We pray uh, that you would work in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead, children. day in the Lord's house. Good to see you all. Pray for those who uh, have not been able to be here for different reasons. Some not feeling well. And uh, Lord, uh, we pray, we'll pray that uh, God would bless uh, Nicholas and the Longos. So we we'll keep praying for them. Uh, and uh, we got have some good news in the past week that he's doing a little better. Now uh, we need to see him get make the next step back. So keep praying. Don't, don't stop praying for him. Pray for one another as we go out into uh, the world. Enjoy a little bit cooler weather this coming week, it looks like. It looks like a nice cool night. Open those windows. But I'll let you go now, so let's close in the word of prayer. Jack, could you close us in prayer, please? Thank you.